Hi there, my name is Vic Veer. I'm an ENT surgeon that works for the NHS in central London. And today I want to tell you about surgery for snoring and how the national guidelines have recently changed in the UK. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence, or NICE, the NICE guidelines have changed at the end of 2021. And I want to explain how they've changed what I think is for the better for people in this country. You see, for many years in this country, sleep centres up and down the country have only really been allowed to give CPAP to their patients because they're mostly run by respiratory physicians. And that's their thing. They give CPAP to patients with obstructive sleep sleep apnea, which is great. It's the first line treatment for most people with obstructive sleep apnea because it's very safe and when you use it, it works very well for obstructive sleep apnea and people are very happy. The people who can use it all the time uh, tolerate it very well. The problem is that some people can't use CPAP all the time and then they're left in limbo. They say, well, I've got obstructive sleep apnea. I know it's bad. I know if my life expectancy is reduced. I'm worried about heart attacks and strokes and diabetes and high blood pressure. What can I do about it? Unfortunately, in this country, up until recently, a lot of the time we've had to say to them, sorry, you've only got CPAP. But now these guys guidelines have changed and I want to tell you all about that. Now, one of the first things I want to mention about these new national guidelines for England is that they've really pushed for mandibular advancement devices. These are these uh, like a gum shield that goes into your mouth and brings your jaw forward. They've specified that really it should be put in by or designed by a proper dental professional that uh, can make it as comfortable as possible. Uh, when they're put in, it fits nicely so you, you don't end up spitting it out in the middle of the night. So that's a great change. So I think that will really help. Getting more of these other sort of conservative options available would really help people avoid struggling with one device and not getting onto something else. Now, obviously, the bit I'm most interested in is a bit about surgery with obstructive sleep apnea. And as I think most of you will be aware, particularly if you're from England, that surgery was not included in any sort of guidelines with obstructive sleep apnea. For the first time in this country, the NICE guidelines have looked at the evidence and found, yes, there is a role for surgery in obstructive sleep apnea. And it's out there clearly in the NICE guidelines, the national guidelines for this country. What I want to do is explain those guidelines and see how they fit into the management of people with obstructive sleep apnea. So the first point is that if you have big tonsils, and we would call it grade three or grade four tonsils, tonsils that you can actually see at the back of your throat, those sorts of size tonsils often cause obstructive sleep apnea. And it even says in the NICE guidelines that if you have big tonsils, really you should consider having those taken out first rather than going for CPAP. In a way, it's a bit like what we do with the children. For decades, we've been saying, ah, if a child has obstructive sleep apnea, you should take out their tonsils and adenoids. It's simple. We don't put CPAP on a, on a five-year-old. It, it's you know, no one does that. But we do know that taking their tonsils and adenoids out often helps them with their obstructive sleep apnea and they're often sort of cured and we don't need to worry about it anymore. But the strange thing in this country for many years was that, okay, so if you're a 16 year old boy in full-time education and you had obstructive sleep apnea, I would take out your tonsils and adenoids. But when you hit your 17th birthday, oh no, no, everything's changed now. You're going to have to have CPAP for the rest of your life because you're now an adult. Now, that didn't make any sense. And most of us said, look, obviously you've got big tonsils, big adenoids, let's take those out. But my feeling was, and has been for a many years and this is what we said to the NICE committee if you've got big tonsils no matter what age you are why does it matter if you're 17 or 27 or 57 if you've got huge tonsils that are clearly causing obstructive sleep apnea why not take those tonsils out by all means give them CPAP afterwards or before it doesn't matter but that's clearly obstruction it works for the kids why doesn't it not work for people who are older and often I've heard from patients who said well they just looked at the numbers of my sleep study and said that I've got sleep apnea and gave me a CPAP machine but no one actually looked in my mouth and you know some of these people have got huge tonsils and they can't breathe at all there's no way that air can push the tonsils apart. It's really, really difficult for these people. All of a sudden you say, look, we'll just take out your tonsils. That, that appears to be the only thing that's blocking your throat. Let's do that. And then they get suddenly better. They don't need their CPAP anymore. And they think to themselves, oh, why did I spend the last five years on CPAP? Surely this would have been a better idea if they, someone looked in my mouth in the first place. Well, now the guidelines are there. Everyone should be looking in your mouth before they prescribe you CPAP. Make sure you don't have big tonsils. Hopefully you can avoid having a mask on for the rest of your life. So another thing that the guidelines talk about is about having a blocked nose. If you have a blocked nose, it's very, very difficult to use CPAP. The reason for this is that you're trying to pump air through your nose into your mouth, whatever. If there's a lot of resistance there because it's blocked, the CPAP has to work doubly hard to get air in. And when it does that, the pressures become very intense. If it's very intense, the, the pressure gets so bad, it sort of leaks around and goes into your eye and wakes you up at night. What you want to have is the pressures to be as low as possible so you can sleep comfortably and the CPAP doesn't disturb you at night. So pressures are really high, you're not going to get much sleep. So if you have a blocked nose, someone should be looking up your nose to check why it's blocked and give you some treatment for that. Also, you need to remember that CPAP causes a blocked nose. And the way this works is that there are turbinates in your nose. So you've got the midline partition here called the septum. And on the side bit here, coming down, there are these things called turbinates. They, they look like sort of gills if you look at it from the side view. And these turbinates 
are covered with um, sort of nose lining and they increase and decrease in size. So they can, if they increase a lot, they can block up your nose completely. Now the point of these turbulence, the reason why we have them is that when you breathe in air through your nose, the air that comes in is moisturized. So it doesn't become all sort of crusty and sort of claggy in your throat. And it also warms it up so it doesn't feel sort of painful in your lungs or in your throat. This is what the turbinates do. And it can only tolerate a certain amount of flow through the nose because you can't, it doesn't work infinitely. You can't blast air in and expect it to work beautifully. So what it does is to slow down the air as it goes through your nose. If you're going like this all the time and the turbulence, if it's going too fast, will swell up to slow down the air as it goes through your nose. So it has time to moisten it and to uh, warm it up. If it's going too quickly, it doesn't get a chance to do those things. So it actively swells up to stop the air from going in so quickly. And I'm guessing you could understand now that if you've got CPAP and it's blasting air in, the first thing these turbulence are going to do is swell up and start slowing down that air, which would work. It means that you can slow it down to the right level so that uh, you can uh, warm it up, etc. But the problem is the CPAP goes, well, I need more pressure to get this uh, uh, throat to open up. So I have to push more air in. And you get this horrible cycle where your nose is filling up because your turbulence are getting bigger. Your CPAP's working really hard to go overcome that. As one goes up, the other one goes up and it's sort of like a race to the top to the point where it's so much pressure that it starts again leaking out the outside and waking you up and you feel like oh, I can't use this anymore. So there are an awful lot of people out there when they get their CPAP, they says it works beautifully for the first few weeks but with time the pressures go up and they feel like oh I can't use it now and it's getting harder and harder. All these patients should be given uh, examination of their nose and given treatment for their nose if they're even slightly blocked up. Now, often when you see people in clinic, it says, you know, I don't have any obstruction in my nose. I feel like I walk around all day and it seems fine. But if you ask people, when you wake up first thing in the morning, does your nose feel quite blocked up? Or are you a mouth breather? You know, all those sorts of questions. Because often people at night have house dust mite allergy. So when they wake up in the morning, they feel very congested. They go, and they feel like they can't breathe. But when they walk around a little bit and they sniff a little bit and they have some breakfast, it all goes away and they feel normal again. So if you're in one of those categories where you feel like, actually, I wake up with a slightly blocked nose but once I walk around I'm feeling better it may be that you do need a nasal spray and you're not actually completely fine and there's no problems you may be just getting a blocked nose at night so seeing your doctor and them saying yeah your nose looks fine it'd be best if we saw you whilst you're asleep whilst you're at the end of the night we can just peer into your nose at that point obviously we can't do that sort of explaining that to your doctor will really help them because you know something as simple as a steroid spray so you don't have to start oh god I can't use this CPAP I know I need to use it but I just can't just think about it and tell your doctor because they should be looking at your tonsils looking at your nose, examining them, making sure there's no other problems so you can use CPAP effectively. So the third thing I want to talk about in these guidelines is that finally the NICE guidelines and national guidelines have said that if you have tried CPAP and you've not got on with it or you can't use it, you haven't got the teeth for a mandibular advancement device or something like that, if you can't get on with conservative measures, you can be eligible for surgery. Now this is national guidelines. Anyone in the country can now ask for this free on the NHS. Uh, you just go to your uh, sleep centre and say, look, I've tried this, I've tried this, you, you know, we've got nowhere. I'm, I'm now untreated for obstructive sleep apnea. My you know, my life expectancy reduced, I'm likely to have a heart attack, stroke, all those things. I need something to help me. What can you do? And in the past, they used to say, oh, look, there's nothing for you. You just got to live with it or something like that. But that's not true anymore. Uh, there's new evidence that's coming out every year about how surgery can help people with obstructive sleep apnea. And finally, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence have said, yes, there's enough um, data out there to prove that having surgery can help some people with obstructive sleep apnea. So you should see an ENT surgeon or someone who deals with this sort of surgery to see if we can get this sorted out. So hopefully with time, other people around the country Country will be starting to provide this sort of surgery for their patients if they really can't use some of the other treatments available to them. So I think this is really exciting. I think this is great for the UK. I'm really, really happy about this and I, and I hope you are as well. I appreciate this video is going a bit longer than most of my videos, so I'm sorry about that. I'm quite excited, obviously, about the new guidelines. Um, in time, I'll talk about the evidence for surgery for sleep apnea. You know, there are huge trials with you know, 873,000 people in them and showing how good surgery works over 20-year periods. And there's all sorts of stuff out there for these sorts of uh, evidence. And I'll go through that one by one for you. In a few videos' time, hopefully, I'll be talking about this new thing. This is, remember, I talked about the Inspire device, the Genio device, hypoglossal nerve stimulators, things to bring your tongue forward. This is a new device called the uh, the Zeus device, which is not implantable. It's not a device that goes in. It sort of sticks like this, like, like here, and I can't use it because I've got a beard. But um, I will be talking about this uh, 
um, device. And the idea is here that it stimulates your tongue, brings your tongue forward, a bit like those implants. And I'll be talking about that soon as well. And I've got other things on the horizon. I'm writing my book. Uh, I'm going to put out some NFTs to uh, help charity. All the proceeds will go to charity. So you know, hopefully I'll, I'll get somewhere with all this. And, and thank you again so, so much for watching my uh, channel. Thank you ever so much. Bye-bye.